here at Grand Prix Washington, D.C. I'm Marshall Sutcliffe in the booth with Jacob Van Luden, and we're ready for quarterfinal action. We've been following Corey Baumeister for the last three tournaments, it feels like. Yeah. <laughs> this is his third Grand Prix top eight in a row. He's playing against Jose Neris. The matchup is Mono White Eldrazi in the hands of Corey Baumeister. He's playing against, well, one of the best decks that we've had in standard since uh, the Pro Tour, Raman Fred. Yeah, Corey, really happy that he gets to be on the play in this matchup, thanks to a better record in the Swiss. That's going to be huge here. Both players getting off to a good start with a one drop. Corey, really, really happy that he has that Inspector on the first turn, because that's a big difference when you're playing against this red deck, especially when you're on the play. It's the kind of speed bump that... Uh might demand a burn spell at some point, in which case Corey is getting incrementally ahead. And there it is. Shock is going to hit that Thraben Inspector to clear the way for a couple of points of damage here. And uh, again, Corey's got to be pretty happy with that result. He's going to get that card back from a clue right now. Yeah, he also gets to use up a little bit of Jose's mana. So now Jose doesn't get to advance his board state at all. He just has that one drop in play. And Corey gets to uh, put a three drop into play in the form of Mattery Shaper. And he's ahead on board now. Mattery Shaper, a major problem for the, the Ramanop Red deck. They often just have to straight up use a burn spell on it. Now, this is the particularly good burn spell to use, though it gets awkward because the Soul Scar Mage actually means that, yes, the Mattery Shaper will die, and he's going to get a free spell. Normally, you'd be really happy <laughs> to have an Incendiary Flow be the spell you use because it cleanly deals with Mattery Shaper, but the Soulscar Mage actually screws that up. It's a replacement effect, and uh, the whole exile thing doesn't happen. So here's an interesting one. He flipped up a Warping Whale. Yeah. Now, uh, he's oh. trying to figure out how Prowess Triggers work with right. uh, the Mattery Shaper happening, so... We're going to get that cleared up. He's going to decide whether or not he's just going to make a Scion. Uh, he, yeah, he should yeah. just be able to make a Scion because what should happen is, is that Jose says, I want to play Incendiary Flow, put it on the stack, and then it'll also trigger Prowess. Prowess trigger resolves, then the Incendiary Flow resolves. Yeah, but the Scion, pretty important here for Corey because now he has access to five mana this turn, and when yes. the Mono White Eldrazi deck has access to five mana, that means at Archangel Avacyn, which is just absurdly good because I mean a Vigilance 4-4 four, four creature is really hard for this red deck to beat and there it is Thought Not Seer kind of the big play here from the Mono White Eldrazi deck this is usually where the things start to turn away though wow look at that hand from Jose yeah an on crop crasher and a pair of Hazarets now normally Corey would be happy to get the Hazaret out of Jose's hand but because it's legendary I mean taking one of them he's still going to be up against another copy so he may be inclined to actually take the Oncrop Crasher. The other thing that's a little bit obnoxious here in Corey's shoes is that by taking the Hazaret, he's actually, or by taking a card out of Jose's hand, he's actually speeding up the rate at which Jose is able to start attacking with those Hazaret the Fervents. All right, Chad is pointing out something interesting that we should point out to the players as well. In that Corey, I believe, was tapped out when that Warping Whale got revealed. And if that's the case, he doesn't get to play it for free. He, it goes to his hand. And he wouldn't have been able to play it right then. Yeah. Like he tapped out for Mattery Shaper, said go. His opponent killed it. Mattery Shaper went to the graveyard. He revealed Warping Whale. It should go into his hand. Oh, yeah, it's not a permanent card. Right. It has to be a permanent. And the chat was all over that one, too. Oh, interesting. And I know the chat's not Back. wrong. Because yeah, they're definitely not wrong. They're chat. Yeah. It looks like the players are just kind of keep on going here, though. Unfortunately, uh, they haven't got the word yet. I don't know if they're going to be able to fix it at this point. They may have been distracted by the fact that they had that awkward world rules interaction where Incendiary Flow didn't actually exile the Matter Reshaper. Yeah, it may have made things a bit confusing. Right. Um, it would actually not be that difficult of a fix because 
I mean, you have to go back so many turns, though. It's just too hard to do. Yeah, you know, I... The thing is, the, spawn, the, thing, the Scion, the only thing it's really done is attack for one. So it's... It hasn't really you know affected the game otherwise. But you know how if you're but, a judge, you just can't... Yeah. They have very specific regulations and rules and practices that they put into place for these type of situations. And even if it seems to us like, well, we could fix that, they have to consider other things to make sure that the integrity of the game stays fully intact. So this could be a little bit awkward as far as rewinding it. I don't know if they're going to be able to do it. We're going to let them decide. Corey's taking another double check at the Mattery Shaper. And it does, in fact, say that it has to be a permanent. You can see his hand motion is like, well, oops. Yeah, now this is super frustrating. I think mean, Corey was really excited about this play on this turn. He'd be able to have cast his Archangel Avacyn, then he would have also sacrificed the Eldrazi Scion, which would have allowed his Archangel Avacyn to flip and then put him in a great position to win the game. But, I mean, it's... Well, we'll see. So what's happening now is the judge is doing uh, an interview where he's asking the players what has happened since that play. And, now, and then the judge will use his judgment to under to try to understand okay well too much has happened it's not realistic to rewind or okay we can do this take these mm -hmm. back and go back to that point in my like i'm not a judge so obviously i i, I wouldn't you know uh say that i know what he's going to decide he or she's going to decide but i will say that it feels like it's been quite a while and that every turn that goes by makes it more difficult to rewind mm -hmm. and we we may very well be past that point but we'll let the judge sort it out here it should just be another couple of minutes and then we will be back underway here in our in our quarterfinal match all these four toughness creatures, really a problem for Jose's deck. He's lucky he has that Hazaret now. And the fact that he had two copies meant that Thought Not Seer couldn't take that out of his hand. Exactly. All right, it looks like it's going to be a uh, game rule violation. They call that a GRV. And they're going to leave the game state as it is. Yeah, and just too much time has passed at this point. Mistake made by the players. These things happen from time to time. Uh, you know, Magic is an incredibly complex game, and they do just, it just happens like this sometimes. It's unfortunate. I don't think that either of the players would prefer for it to be like that, but it happens. Yeah, definitely frustrating for both players. And obviously, neither of them knew at the time. A couple of the uh, people in chat were asking if we could recap for those just joining what, what's happening here. Basically, we had a fairly straightforward scenario that got a little bit complicated. There was a matter reshaper, and it was hit by Incendiary Flow. But there was a Soul Scar Mage out. So Incendiary Flow would normally exile the matter reshaper, but it didn't because the Soul Scar Mage says instead of damage, it's going to put these minus one, minus one counters on. Therefore, it actually does die, and it triggers. But Matter Reshaper specifically says... Permanent card. Yeah, you reveal the top card of your library when it dies, which it did. Uh, you may put that card onto the battlefield if it's a permanent card with converted mana cost three or less. Otherwise, put that card into your hand. The revealed card was Warping Whale, which is an instant, and uh, therefore would go automatically into hand for Corey. But the players thought that he could cast it for free, so he did. He made that Eldrazi Scion that you see sitting on the battlefield. And it's uh, been there for the last two turn cycles, you know, mm -hmm. two and a half turn cycles here. Um, it has attacked once, and it stands to serve a pretty important role this turn from what we know, yeah, because, because there's an Archangel the Avacyn. Right, and that one of the keys to this mono right Eldrazi deck is that their top end is Thought Not Seer and Avacyn. And Avacyn can transform with one of your creatures dies. And they have multiple creatures that can die when you choose for them, like an Eldrazi Scion. You also see a spawning bed for Cory Baumeister. They also have Selfless Spirit that can die. Oh, good. We get to look at a live look in and not talk about this judge <laughs> call for a few minutes. Bo Lung Zong versus Matt Severa. Looks like they're still in game number one here, Jake. Um, 
Wow, this is a pretty well built out board with a pair of Thought Knots ears over there for Matt. You know, we see Matt Severa playing this version of Mardu Vehicles that's playing Deserts and Thought Knot Seers, uh, eschewing Gideon Ally of Zendikar, which for a long time people thought to be the most powerful deck in the Mardu Vehicles archetype. Uh, the thing about playing Deserts in Mardu Vehicles is it gives the deck even more reach than it already had. And when you're nearly only tons of incidental damage with random vehicles, with unlicensed disintegration, it can become very easy to finish off a game by sacrificing a couple Deserts to Ramanap Ruins. So... A very exciting new build of Mardu Vehicles for you guys at home. Uh, if you're looking to build uh, an aggressive deck that's not just a run-of-the-mill thing that we've seen a ton of in Standard, this might be what you're looking for. Ruins has just been such a good card in this Standard format. I mean, it really changed the way we play against these red decks. It's forced people to actually turn the corner and race people. You can't just control the board and hope that things work out. On the other side of the board, though, uh, Bristling Hydra, traditionally one of the best cards against these aggressive decks. Catacomb Sifter also, a uh, nice sized body when you're dealing with these things. By the way, I had a chance to talk to a friend of Polum here, and I, it's like hard to believe, but he told me that Bolin's only been playing for a little over a year, what? and that he top aided one of the Vegas GPs as well. That's kind of absurd. Like, wow. <laughs> yeah. Magic's hard. It's, it's hard to real, pick up. It takes years to build up the skill that you need to get this good. And I, we might have a real talent on our hands here because that is an impressive start to your career. Yeah, not many people can say they've done that after having played that little. No. It looks like he's in a rough spot here, though. We see that uh, Ruins on the other side of the table. He's at one life now. Attacking now with Bristling Hydra. Trying to figure out if there's any way that he could win this game. It's not going to be easy. Has one card in hand, Walking Ballista on one. All right, we're going to head back to our main match. It looks like they did get things sorted out and are back underway. And I can tell you what happened while we were gone. Um, well, that's not the right one. There we go. Uh, so what happened is Corey, so the ruling was, sorry, we can't rewind. And Corey actually appealed it because I think just because he felt bad. He just said, yeah. look, I, I, can I just give him the life back and put this card in my hand and, you know, kind of, just do the things that you would need to undo this proactively. And the judge said, I can't allow you to do that. Those aren't, that isn't within the rules. So Corey said, well, let me talk to the head judge and I'll ask because, you know, I made a mistake here. I, I, I had an about oversight. To win, actually. I know, I, yeah. I'm seeing it too. Uh, you know, he, Corey had an oversight there, so he called the head judge. The judge said, that that's not allowed. You know, you, you can't just, you know, do things that are against the rules within the game, in, even if it is in the interest of fairness. They've both received a GRV. That's a game rule violation. And, uh, and the board state was too far gone for them to come back. And so the judge said no. Uh, so that means that you play on from that position. And that's just how it works. I mean, it is a tough thing, right? It, it, you know, even Corey can see this isn't the way that uh, he wanted it to go. But from that point on, you're kind of obliged just to play from the board state that you're at. And you can see that Jose and Corey are having a chat about it here. And they seem to have... Uh, come to good terms. So Jose, uh, so Corey does win game number one, and uh, he's, he's going to be one game away from advancing to the semifinals here as we bump back over to Bolung Zhang versus Matt Severa. Matt crashing in for lethal. Pump fake the handshake, but uh, we've got two more games, or at least one more game to play here between these two. Matt Severa taking down game number one over Bolung Zhang with Mardu Vehicles. Black Green Constrictor, here's a deck that I think for the past couple of weeks we kind of thought it was dead. You know, after uh, Corey and Brad did so well with it in Minneapolis, it hasn't had much in the way of results. This is exciting. Here we have Collins has Ulamog the Ceaseless Hunger in play, and uh, 
That is exciting for Collins Mullen. Bradley Yu probably <laughs> disagrees a little bit with the <laughs> level of excitement here. But this is where Bristling Hydra looks quite weak. Um, the fact that it's powerful and difficult to kill is really good in some matchups, but when it could just bump into a Thraben Inspector while Bradley's getting smashed by, a, uh, by an Ulamog, it looks a lot less good. Additional to that, Bradley's at exactly 10 life and is now compelled to chump block with the Bristling Hydra. And things looking very good for Collins Mullen here to pick up game number one. Yeah, one more attack will be good enough to deck Bradley, even if he does have a chain of blockers that lasts seemingly forever. Right. And it's going to be incredibly difficult for Bradley to get through two blockers here. Though he could. He's got three cards in hand. Maybe he just goes removal spell, removal spell. Uh, that's six, four. Oh, that actually... That actually takes Mullen out of lethal range from the Hydra now, too, though. So the combination of the fact that Bradley needs to get three more damage through and has to kill both creatures to do it means he's going to scoop him up. And that's going to be Collins Mullen with green, white, ramp. Now you heard that right. Green, yeah. white, ramp is uh, now one game away from the semis. And Green White Ram seems like it matches up very well against this team or energy strategy. Uh, in the past, whenever I've played a mid-range deck, these ramp decks and ramp type strategies are just the nightmare matchup always. That's kind of how it goes in Magic. You know, when you play a deck like Abzan or Junt, you never want to run into the Tron deck. Mm -hmm. That's just how it is because they're playing bigger, more powerful things. And a lot of their effects, uh, a lot of the cards that they have have effects that are just really powerful and you don't have an answer to those effects. So if you can't go underneath them and kill them, or if you can't prevent the big thing they have from coming down to the table, then you find yourself in a really bad position. And even if you have ways to rip apart their hand or ways to interact in post-boarded games, the top of their library can just be so dangerous. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be a tough matchup there for a team or energy player against just Collins and his green-white ramp deck. Sainaris is going to be on the play here in the second game. And that's huge in a matchup like this. Yeah, that Ramanop red deck really is able to capitalize on the play like few others. So many cheap interactive one drops and burn spells where they can just get a, a board state going, clear away any of the early blockers and smash. Corey's up a game here. And the deck has enough reach that once you get to that stage of the game, it gets really, really hard to come back and win unless you can close very fast. Looking here at their sideboards, trying to find out what the best iteration will be for next games. Corey has uh, three copies of Sunscourge Champion in his sideboard. He's probably happy about that. He also has... Some extra warping whales. I don't know if he'll want to bring those in. Probably depends on how he expects Jose to uh, be sideboarding here. Yeah, we have seen that the Ramanop red deck can take a kind of different tack post sideboard where it plays bigger spells like Chandra, you know, those type of things. Sometimes they don't play that many of them in the main. And, uh, you know, the deck can turn into a more of like a glory bringer Chandra style deck rather than a, you know, Falcon Wrath Gorger style deck. And that's going to be a big decision for Corey because, you know, if he's tearing down a bunch of dragons and planeswalkers, he's not going to want to look down at those warping rules. Yeah, important to note, though, uh, Jose Sideboard has a few throwbacks here that might be pretty good in this matchup. I think Hour of Devastation could be a card that he might want, depending on how he expects this game to go. Um, he has Sand Stranglers, which seem like they're very strong against Corey's deck. Should be interesting. A lot of different directions both of these players can go. Fortunately, if Jose does decide to go for the bigger plan, Avacyn just matches up so well against every part of that big plan. You know, Chandra, you know, it can't really deal with the flyer. Um, the fact that Avacyn has flash means that it's really hard to kill Avacyn with a Chandra, too. Right. Um, Glorybringer, you know, seems like it would be decent in the spot, but the fact that Avacyn could just come down and kill Block. it basically for free makes it a really dangerous card. So 
a lot of things that might seem on the surface to be good against a deck like Corey's become really bad against the specific card, Archangel Avacyn, that Corey's going to be playing four copies of. And has many ways, has built his deck around it as well with, as we talked about in game one, different ways to sacrifice his own creatures to get Avacyn transformed and wipe the board on at least a normal Ramanop Red style uh, start. Though again, the deck does have a few different looks post sideboard, so we don't know for sure what Jose's uh, game plan is, but. Yeah, Jose has a one lander there, and he had three cards that cost one mana in his opening hand, but it decides that it's not worth it. He's going to go ahead and mulligan. Uh, the only permanent card he had that he could cast with the lands in his hand was a Beaumont Courier. It's pretty hard to lean on that, especially when you're playing against a deck that you know has four copies of Inspector. What is Jose looking at his sideboard for? Oh, I think he has too many in there. I think he's got 16, 17 cards in his board still, and maybe just recognize that after he mulliganed. Oh, uh, so he might present an illegal deck. Yeah, it's possible. I really hope that's not the case. They're going to have to ask. That would be very unfortunate. Yeah, he does have 16 cards in his board. And he, as far as I saw, he went to Mulligan's, mulliganed, and then realized it, which is kind of awkward. Yeah, definitely a really rough spot to be in. I'm sure his head's not in the right place after the game before. Yeah, th this match has been... Uh, Hard to watch. It's been a tough one yeah, for, yeah. For, for Jose. The thing is that, you know, Magic, it's it's a tough game. Yeah. It can be brutal. Yeah. Oh, and I mean, if he over-sideboarded, that's okay now, right, with the new rules? Yeah. If, if he has a 61-card deck? Well... Well, he has 16 cards in his board. Oh, if he has 16 in the board, he then... He does. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I really hope he has 16 cards. Looks like they're talking to the too. judge now. Yeah, this is not a great spot because... The, so he... What, what this means is that he would have presented his deck as 59 cards, presumably. Which is illegal. Which, which, which is not a legal which is not legal, and the judges <coughs> are going to have to give out something for that, and the judge is going to have to sort that out. But I, yeah. I'll tell you what, I've, I've seen game losses for that. Yeah, that's usually a game loss. Most of the time, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I'm not going to predict here because I don't know, but... And I'm sure it's at the judge's discretion. I have uh, seen that. To consider all different things that are transpiring. great run here. I feel like red was a great choice for this weekend. I think people's sideboards had uh, become a lot less focused to beat it. Let's take a look at uh, game two as it gets underway. We will, we will jump back to the main match once we know the outcome of that judge call, if we have more action. Uh, Bolung Zhang versus Matt Severa, though. Matt with the big win in that first game, and now you can see he's got a key play here on turn two. He has the burn spell to take out that long tusk cub before it gets out of hand. Does he have another? Z wow, good turns here for Severa, taking out the first two threats from Bolun. And, uh, yeah, and look at this. Transgress the mines the next play. And he reveals a hand of uh, Ramanap Ruins, Aethersphere Harvester, and Unlicensed Disintegration here. Uh, Aethersphere Harvester going to uh, be exiled there by Transgress the Mind. Uh, Bolin does not have any presence on board just yet, so doesn't want to let Matt advance his board state. Instead, going to uh, make Matt keep the reactive card. Seems wise. You want your opponent to keep the reactive cards when you are behind, and you want your opponent to keep the proactive cards when you're ahead. Bolin playing well there, using his discard spell. 
Meantime, Matt Severa is going to get aggro here. Needle Spires is going to get fired up, and he's going to jam for seven. It's a lot of damage. Bolin and, already down to ten here. Yeah, with no board state and missing lands, this one could be over very quickly in Matt Severa's favor. A glint sleeve siphoner could help stem the bleeding here, but and we know that Matt has a licensed integration in hand. And I mean, that's three damage, and it kills a creature, so it's extremely dangerous. Matt right. has a lot of options here, though. Looks like we have a ruling on our main table. Uh, illegal deck presentation, but the deck's going to get fixed from 59 to 60, and he's going to start with an opening hand of six. So thank goodness we get to see more action here in the top eight. I would really have been bummed if that's how that ended. So this is great news for us at home, viewing as well as for Jose, and even for Corey. I mean, he wants to play a fair fight here as well. So here we go. Jose off to a great start with Soul Scar Mage. He's got Kerry Zev as a follow-up play. Nothing yet for Corey. And Corey does not have that crucial one drop that's so strong in this matchup. It does look like he has a pair of spatial contortions in hand, though, which are pretty good here. Yeah. Can kill Kerry Zev. Ooh, the perfect curve here, though, from Jose. The one, two, three. Yeah. Oh, very difficult to beat that when your opponent's on the play. Corey now going to have to decide... Uh, how he wants to use his spatial contortion. He's going to use it to take down the Oncrop Crasher. Makes sense. It represents the most damage along, along with Kari Zev, plus uh, you know, also just makes sure that his blockers do more when he plays them. Raghavan overstayed his welcome a little bit, but Corey shoot him away. Wow. Corey once again just passes the turn. He did use his mana up on turn two, but he's going to need another play here on the third turn. Does he have another spatial contortion? I mean, that's I would be led to believe so if he doesn't have any turn three play and he kept the hand. Right, so he's trying to stem the bleeding as much as humanly possible here, and he's doing a pretty good job. He's actually only slated to take two damage this turn. Now, make it five. <laughs> yeah. Still, Corey's down to 10, but this is a huge turn for him because we've seen him repeatedly untap and on his fourth turn make big plays, though I will say that one of them that he doesn't get to make this time, at least it would have its normal big impact, is Thought Not Seer, as Jose has completely emptied his hand now. Yeah, so, I mean, that triggered ability on Thought Not Seer becomes a pretty big liability. Ooh, but there's Sunscourge Champion. You mentioned that out of the sideboard, Jake. That's a nice one here. Yeah, really good against this red deck. And, you know, the fact that you get to cast it the first time around and then embalm it, it can be really hard for them to catch up with that amount of life game. It's a great way to get yourself back into the game. And this is perfect here for Corey. I mean, it's not great. It's a braid off the top from Jose, but at least it was an incendiary flow. Although now that I say that, there's a Soul Scar Mage again on the battlefield. Yes. <laughs> and so now we could see Corey Baumeister just eternalize the, Soul, the Sun Scourge champion here, put himself back up for more life and have another big blocker. Yeah, and I mean, he's already down to seven, so he's probably going to have to do that if he wants to save off this bleeding. And it might not be good enough. Jose's off to a really fast start. He has a couple cards up into that Bormat Courier already. Yeah, we didn't get the life total updated there, did we? I, there we go. There it is. <laughs> little, little slow. This is a fast matchup. We need our life total person yeah. <laughs> on point. And yeah, he is just going to go ahead and eternalize here the Sun Scourge champion. And that's going to put him back up to 11 with a solid blocker against opponent who's top decking. He really has to hold his breath here. Does not want to see Oncrop Crasher come off the top of the library for Jose. Yeah, that would be just about the worst card Jose could draw. Looks like it's a one-mana spell. It's another Bomac Courier. Are we going to see Jose cash in that first Bomac Courier here? I imagine he will. He'll probably wait at least for it to uh, get that point of damage in. But Yeah. Three cards is a nice pickup there off your one mana card that's already dealt quite a bit of damage. Corey's going to try to prevent the most damage possible by blocking the Falconrath Gorger here, which means he's going to take three, fall down to seven, and oh, Jose's going to hold off for now. Interesting. I mean, if, Bo if he had chosen to sacrifice that Beaumont Courier and had drawn one of his one mana burn spells, he could have finished off the Sunscourge Champion, but instead deciding that he wants to gain even more value off these Beaumont Couriers and it might be a wise decision if he expects this game to go pretty long. 
God, I mean, if I'm him, I'm hoping this game doesn't go very long at all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I might do everything in my power to make that happen. Also, based on the way Corey's played the game, Corey likely has more spot removal spells in hand. So by doing it this way, you know, you kind of punish Corey for trying to use a removal spell. Corey does, in fact, have another copy of Spatial Contortion in hand. He could do the old draw step thing with that if he wants. It's a dangerous situation, though. We have to remember Corey's second source of white mana is that Shafet Dunes. So he's already taken, I think, two damage off that Shafet Dunes. And those are really crucial points of life. So, I mean, that's, you know, a third of the life that he's gained off this Sunscourge champion has already fallen to the wayside. So. Corey has, I think, an Eldrazi Displacer. Is that possible? That's correct. Okay, yeah. So he's considering playing that and leaving up Contortion. He's just going to pass. This leaves up potential for maybe two removal spells or Archangel dun, dun, Avacyn. Archangel Avacyn. Ooh. This is a big draw step from Jose. He looked at it really quickly and then didn't do anything. If it's a land, we'll see him play it because he may have to crack the Bomat Courier at some point here, and he'll want to make sure he gets his value first. Team. Everything coming in here. Trigger, trigger, trigger. And Corey's like, yep. There she is. Archangel Avison is going to force the issue here. And Corey may decide to block the Bobak Courier with less cards underneath it, uh, kind of knowing that Jose is just going to sacrifice that Bobak Courier that has all the cards underneath it anyway. And, um, and then also block the Soul Scar Mage? Yeah, I think the Soul Scar Mage is an easy block here, probably. Okay. And then I like this line a lot from Corey. Still dangerous, though. I mean, he's just took a point off his dunes. All right, so Hazaret is going to get discarded because he is going to sacrifice that Bomac Courier that was going to just die anyway. He gets in for one, knocks Corey down to six, draws two off of the Courier. He'd love to see a land and a play here. He wants to just get empty again, though. Maybe he just has to leave Bomac Courier up. Oh, boy, that was a Sunscorched Desert. I think Corey may actually be at four here. You're right. Yeah. Yeah, perfect play there from Jose, though, with... Uh, Using up his mana, but still leaving himself that one extra mana so that if he needs to, he can sacrifice the Bomac Courier. And Corey needs to, you know, not only does he need to keep himself alive, but he needs to close this game really, really fast. He's down to four life. He can, though. He's got eight power on the battlefield. Yeah, and something that else that's interesting here is that Spatial Contortion, while it is an unbelievably powerful removal spell. Mm -hmm. It can also be used offensively here with the four toughness creatures that Corey has available to him. He can use it to deal an additional three damage, and that may come into play if Corey turns this game into a race and is able to get through those final points of damage. Coming in now for eight points of damage, trying to turn that corner. We've talked about how important that can be. Yep, he's moved in. Trying to knock Jose down to 12. Whoa, Jose's actually going to block. I think Jose views this as a game of burn spells at this point. I like that from Jose a lot. He recognizes that it's unlikely he's going to be attacking with more creatures this game. He needs to draw burn spells to finish off his opponent. And so he wants to keep his life total as high as possible. There's Matter Reshaper now from Corey, and here we go. This is huge. These four cards plus this draw step, he needs to find basically any two burn spells in his deck. He also could find a Ramanop Ruins plus a burn spell to do this over the next turn. What did he find? Land, 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 land? It looks like he's got a hand with four lands and a Hazaret. Oh, no! And I think Corey may have this one now. Well, if he... If he gets to untap, he can go land, activate, activate, right? Hazaret twice. That's true. So Corey's so got to figure out a way to four, win this eight, turn. 4, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 with the Spatial Contortion. It's not enough. No, it is not. Even though Hazaret cannot attack or block, 
she's representing lethal just from her activated ability. Corey can try to find a way to deal lethal here by killing his own Matara Shaper, however, and then flipping into another threat. Because in doing so, he'll put Jose down to 13 when he kills his own Matara Shaper. And he'll have 10 flip, damage. And then he'll have 10 damage. And if he's able to flip into something that deals three power, or if he's able to find a spatial contortion on the top of his deck in the next two draws, that will be good enough. He may also just be looking to draw another white source and then be able to use Shafet Dunes to finish off. Which would be, what, 5, 10, 14? Oh, it's not quite enough, yeah. Not, no, he, it, the mana gets awkward because he oh, wants to actually 16, right? If he, has, if he has the white source for it. Is it? No, 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 because I'm, I'm sorry. I was counting Avacyn as six. Yeah. <laughs> because yeah, oh, I had done the flip in my right, head. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. right, right, right. So <laughs> yeah, I, it feels like Corey's going to come up a little short here. Displace or go, but Jose can go land, hit you, hit you. Jose keeps looking at the life pad like, you're at four, right? Oh, so close this game. Oh, now this is interesting because... Oh, okay. Yep. Yep. There we go. Just throws two lands at Corey Baumeister's head, and all he needed in the end was the Hazaret. Interesting there. He he might have wanted to spatial contortion his own matter shaper, hoping to hit a Sunscourge champion, right? Yes. That might have helped. <laughs> I like that line. Yeah. All right, Bradley, you here with quite the board. Chandra Flamecaller and Glorybringer on the table. He is down a game, though. And we don't know how many approaches have been cast this game or not cast this game. So, even though it looks good for Bradley from our seat right now, we could be wrong. <laughs> well, that's a way to turn around. We were wrong. The game. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> wow. Ulamog the Ceaseless Hunger just had lunch. And that is bad news for Bradley Yu on Teamer Energy facing down one of the best threats in the format here. He doesn't get much better than Ulamog and uh, very difficult to answer on top of that. It's not like there's just clean answers floating around in Teamer here. He's going to have to do some backflips to get rid of Ulamog. It looks like he does have a Confiscation coup in hand, but doesn't have quite enough energy to... Take the massive threat on the other side of the table. Mountain here. The Tomb of the Ether trying to build up some energy. And I mean, when your opponent casts Ulamog, you're generally in a pretty rough spot. Yeah. <laughs> that is usually the turning port of the game away from you. And Bradley, you really has his hands full now. With Collins at 14, it's really hard to imagine that he uh, gets out of this. Sure, Tyros Tracker sweet. Did uh, Bradley already play land? Do we know? He no, did he not. did not. Okay. You know, something we've seen now since Tyler's Tracker was printed. You cast it, you play your land, you automatically refund the card that you spent on it. Of course, it generally does not match up too well against Ulamog the Ceaseless Hunger. <laughs> Looks like Collins has a really exciting card in his hand, Oblivion Sower. I love that card. Me too. Oh, man. Why didn't that see more play? <laughs> Card's so sweet. Yeah. I think commander players play it, though. They're the only smart ones, apparently. Here comes uh, Ulamog the Ceaseless Hunger to gobble up oh, about 20 cards worth of library. Is Oblivion Sower going to be enough to deck? No. Oh, that'd be kind of sweet. Yeah, yeah. The lethal Oblivion Sower. Yeah. 
but no, it is going to end up being another attack from Ulamog, but I think but that's, it's fun to think about. Think, I think that's what's <laughs> going to happen anyway. Yeah. Right? I. Mullen's kind of taking stock of the exiled cards here. Yeah, trying to figure out what outs Bradley you could still have in his deck based on the cards that have been exiled. Right. He's also just pulled the lands out. Lining up that sower. Now all those lands are going to come into the battlefield. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he only hit one off the trigger. <laughs> This is this is great. This is just oh, look at this nonsense. so much fun. Lucky that they're playing with different sleeves. Wait, who, who, <laughs> does he have more of Bradley's lands now than his own? That was insane. He's like, oh, I get he an may. energy. He's like, hey, hey, I get an energy too. So I'll just put that here. <laughs> this is too funny. That's insane. I was really hoping. Wait, what is he doing no. now? <gasps> What is going on? Oh, he's got Linvala, too. <laughs> All right, let's get back to our main match. It is back underway. I think we can call that one for Collins. That was some nonsense right there. <laughs> and we got an exciting Game 3 conclusion here. A bit of a bumpy start to our quarterfinal, but we are cleanly underway here. Jose Neris just won the last game. A real nail-biter against Corey. Corey won Game 1, and that means that we've got an exciting Game 3 conclusion. Corey with that clue here. Something to do with his man on the second turn. Very happy he had the one drop. Does not have a two to follow it up, though. I didn't see a spatial contortion in his hand either. The ideal card in that situation. Ooh, Jose. A pair of Remanap Ruins as his lands, and Corey's deck is definitely capable of racing, so it's going to get pretty painful here. Yeah, you don't normally think of it that way, but... Like right here, he could play, say, an Eldrazi Displacer or Matter Reshaper and start bashing. Mm -hmm. Sunscourge, Sunscourge champion. champ, yeah, sure. You know, considering that Jose's done stone nothing this turn, he'll take anything he can get. He has a Sunscourge champion, too. He just decided for the higher power creature. And who can blame him when he looks at his opponent's side of the table? Agreed. I mean, one thing the red deck does not do particularly well is play defense. And hey, they actually figured it all out. <laughs> this time, Incendiary Flow does what it's supposed to do, exiles it. And, uh, and there will be no trigger from the Matter Reshaper for them to uh, screw up this time. <laughs> <laughs> I like how emphatically Corey made sure that was not in his graveyard. <laughs> Yeah, well, you can see they both had a little fun, kind of like, aha! <laughs> yeah, laughing about it. We know what to do here. So here's uh, a second copy of Matter Reshaper now for Corey ba Baumeister. So far, Jose's only done damage via Sunscorch, uh, Sunscorch Desert, but... Uh, yeah, his lands have been dealing a lot of damage to both players. We'll continue to do so. Yeah, there's a lot of damage lined up with those lands, isn't there? Yeah, it's go both ways. Go both ways. He's got two <laughs> Romanoff Ruins and two Sunscorched Deserts as his mana base. He's got the Angriest. You can see the hand of, uh, of our graphics personnel down there, just switching out the energy counter. We just like to use the official. You know, just there's some people that watch the stream that might be confused about what's going on if you use a non-official energy counter just because we like to be consistent here on the stream and make sure that even players who are a little newer to the game know exactly what's going on. Our game can be hard enough to follow as is. There's four more damage crashing in though for Corey Baumeister and everybody knows what that means. He's just winning the race and you know I think even the new players at this point go hmm five mana <laughs> yeah, four yeah. cards in hand. I think I know what you might have. Yeah finally it smells like Avacyn again. In yeah. The you know like two weeks ago we were like Oh, what, what could have? it be? Yeah. <laughs> now it's like, I know what's going on. Yeah. It's back to the way it was a couple mm -hmm. months ago. That's right. And just when you draw a lot of these deserts, sometimes it can just be so painful. It's really, really hard when you're in a, like a creature mirror, and that's the set of lands you draw, because you know, even if you have an offensive draw, which Jose did not, uh, your opponent can often just race you, especially when you're exerting a lot of creatures. 
Wow, this really does. If he has Avison, this really illustrates the point that we were talking about where it's very difficult to actually kill Avison with Chandra. You know, if Corey doesn't want to have that, then he can do it. And there she is, Avison, to start pressuring Chandra. Jose wisely not attacking with his on-crop crasher there. He just played it and said go. Remember, he has to attack first, and then Corey can flash in Avison and block. He never has the opportunity to make her unable to block. So smart play there from Jose. He knew what was up. This is interesting now. Uh, Corey has two copies of Spatial Contortion here, so he can use one to take out that blocker, use the other one to make his Avison F7 power, and that's a lethal attack. And that actually does it. That's Corey yeah. Baumeister advancing to the semis. Ignore Chandra. Get in there for lethal. And Corey Baumeister's on his way once again, maybe to another finals. We'll see. Hang in there, guys. We'll be back with more after these messages.